Hello everyone, today we will be talking about Ludwig's angina. This is named after Carl Friedrich Wilhelm von Ludwig. Ludwig's angina is characterized as a rapidly progressive gangrenous cellulitis of the soft tissues of the neck and floor of the mouth. With progressive swelling of the soft tissues and elevation and posterior displacement of the tongue, it's the most life-threatening complication of Ludwig's angina is airway obstruction. Prior to the development of antibiotics, mortality for Ludwig's angina exceeded 50%. As a result of antibiotic therapy, along with improved imaging modalities and surgical techniques, mortality currently averages approximately 8%. In Ludwig's angina, the submandibular space is the primary site of infection. This space is subdivided by the mylohyoid muscle into the sublingual space superiorly and the submaxillary space inferiorly. The majority of cases of Ludwig's angina are odontogenic in etiology and primarily resulting from infections of the second and third molars. So when we say odontogenic in etiology, it means they are arising from teeth or their associated structures. However, the most commonly affected teeth are second and third molars. So this is basically a diagram showing what I just talked about. The mylohyoid muscle is separating the spaces. As you can see, the submaxillary space is beneath the mylohyoid muscle and on top we have the sublingual space. So this one, I, another diagram showing a similar presentation. This is an example of a patient that has got Ludwig's angina. The roots of these teeth penetrate the mylohyoid ridge such that any abscess or dental infection has direct access to the submaxillary space. Once infection develops, it spreads contagiously to the sublingual space. Infection can also spread contagiously to involve the pharyngomaxillary and retropharyngeal spaces, thereby encircling the airway. Odontogenic infections account for over 90% of cases. <coughs> Additional etiologies include mandible fracture, neck trauma, tongue piercing, cell denitis, neoplasm, and other peripheral infections. Polymicrobial infection occurs in over 50% of cases. The most commonly cultured organisms include Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and bacteroid species. Patients with immunocompromising conditions such as HIV, Diabetes, transplant recipients, and alcoholics are at risk for infection from a variety of atypical organisms. So examples of atypical organisms isolated in these patients include Pseudomonas, E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterococcus fecalis, Candida, and Clostridium. The majority of cases of Ludwig's angina occur in healthy patients with no comorbid diseases. Nevertheless, there are several conditions that have been shown to produce both patients to Ludwig's and China. So some conditions that are associated with a predisposition to Ludwig's and China include diabetes mellitus, alcoholism, acute glomerulonephritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, aplastic anemia, neutropenia, and dermatomyositis. So how do you diagnose Ludwig's angina? So Ludwig's angina is mainly a clinical diagnosis. The majority of patients report dental pain or history of recent dental procedures and neck swelling. Less common complaints include neck pain, dysphonia, dysphagia, and dysarthria. Less than one third of adults will present in respiratory distress with dyspnea, tachypnea, or strida. On physical examination, over 95% of patients have bilateral submandibular swelling and an elevated or protruding tongue. The submandibular swelling is often characterized as brown and tense with overlying erythema. Management of Ludwig's angina. Airway management is the foundation of treatment for patients with Ludwig's angina. Unfortunately, the, the decision to secure the airway continues to rely on clinical judgment and experience. At present, there are established guidelines for airway control in patients with Ludwig's angina. Current recommendations are primarily based on individual experience and institution-specific resources. Clearly, any patient presenting in respiratory distress or impending airway obstruction requires immediate intubation. 
Recommended techniques include routine orotracheal intubation and fiber optic nasotracheal intubation. Blind nasotracheal intubation should not be attempted in patients with Ludwig's angina given the potential for bleeding and abscess rupture. In non-intubated patients with Ludwig's angina, airway equipment including tracheostomy and cricothyroidotomy instruments must be at the bedside. Antibiotics should be initiated as soon as possible. Antibiotics should initially be broad spectrum and cover gram positive, gram negative and anaerobic organisms. Combinations of penicillin, clindamycin and metronidazole are typically used. Recent case reports have advocated the use of intravenous steroids. In these reports, corticosteroid administration potentially avoided the need for airway management. To date, there are no randomized control trials that demonstrate the efficacy of corticosteroids in patients with Ludwig's angina. Up to 65% of patients with Ludwig's angina have developed separative complications that require surgical drainage. Physical examination alone is sufficient in determining which patients require a surgical procedure. In a recent study of deep neck space infections, the clinical exam underestimated the true extent of infection in 70% of patients. As a result, imaging is indicated in patients with Ludwig's angina. Once antibiotics have been administered and decisions in regard to error management have been made. Although plain films can demonstrate submandibular soft tissue swelling, they are inadequate in detecting patients who require surgical drainage. As a result, a CT scan with intravenous contrast is recommended to detect patients who have developed separative complications. So that's all about Ludwig's angina. Thank you.